Until Then is a recently released Filipino indie visual novel game. It is an amazing title with beautifully crafted characters, a setting deeply inspired by the team's roots, as well as an intricate and interesting plot. I adore this title, and highly recommend it to everyone, but over the course of this video, I intend on walking us through the vast 20 hour plot of the game, helping to remind us of every plot point that occurred, before concluding with an explanation of the true ending to try and polish out any confusion that may have happened. Before we start, some quick statements. 1. If for you the game ended after Mark played the racing game, please be aware that is not the end of the game. There is another at least 10 hours of gameplay afterwards requiring you to hit the continue button that appears after the credits. I advise you do so before watching this. 2. If you're only interested in just having the ending explained or certain parts of the game explained, this video will have many different timestamps in the description allowing you to jump around as is needed. Finally, if you haven't played the game, be aware that this video will be filled with spoilers. And while I will do my best to convey the plot the best I can, this is a story that is best experienced yourself, not told to you. So I highly suggest that you take the time to play the game or at bare minimum, watch someone else play through it. With that out of the way, let's get right into this. Let's start by introducing our main character. Mark is a high school student in the Philippines. He lives alone, funded by his parents who work abroad. He's trying to learn the piano in his free time, attempting to replay a song he remembers his mother playing from when he was young. But he's yet to really get any hang of it. The game starts with him heading to class, but as he's on his way, he gets a text from Louise, the class president, and someone he holds a slight crush on. She reminds him of a project due in the morning that he hasn't even started, as he was busy gaming the night prior. Not wanting to disappoint Louise, Mark gets his groupmate and friend, Ryan, to quickly cram and hammer out the project in the library before class. This mundane event sets off the events of the rest of the game, as these slides end up being shockingly good which prompts Louise to invite Mark to her chess match the next day. At this chess match, Mark meets Louise's eccentric best friend, Sophia, and the two hang out for a little bit while Louise wins the match. Sophia has to leave as her grandmother is in the hospital, leaving Louise and Mark alone. The pair talk, and Mark learns that Louise has a boyfriend, destroying his chances, but also learns that apparently, recently, Louise, as well as many others, have been experiencing false memories memories of things that never happened. Mark also experiences a bore of the mind here, during mentions of these memories, suggesting that something may be amiss. Mark goes to hang out with Kathy, his best friend and adorable goober after this. Kathy remarks that she's sad that Rydal, their other best friend, has been busy with life. Kathy also expresses that she's upset that she can't be the one to date Louise now that Louise is known to be taken, before trying to move on by focusing on the new transfer students that are inbound. The pair look into these students, and they find a girl named Nicole Laksamana. The mere mention of her invokes a boy of the mind and a feeling of familiarity in Mark. Also, from now on, I'll be referring to this boy of the mind effect where the screen gets all rocky and it seems like Mark's struggling as mental strain, since that seems to be what it's actually doing to him. Mark swears he has heard of her before, despite never meeting her prior. The next day, Mark goes to class very early with Kathy to try and convince the new student to their class, Kate, to become their friend. Despite their efforts, they have no real success, and due to the very early nature of the morning, Mark falls back asleep. He sleeps through most of the day, before waking up slightly before art class. His relief at not sleeping through his worst class is ruined when he learns of yet another assignment, this time due in seven minutes. Deciding to cram it in once more, he sprints out of the class and down the halls, dodging various people who are in the way. Just before he can make it to the supply center, though, in the school, he swams into a girl who is painting in the hallway. This girl turns out to be none other than Nicole. Nicole and Mark are sent to the principal's office for their actions, and Nicole, new to the school and having just been sprinted into, is understandably quite angry at Mark. Mark tries his best to befriend her, and the pair seem to grow to like how stubborn they both are as people. The principal orders the two to work together on fixing their project, prompting Mark to go to Nicole's house to paint a replacement. The pair seem to get along pretty well while painting, but Mark develops a guilt over the quality of her creation, resulting in him deciding to make a horrible version for himself and sign it, forcing her to not be able to help him out. 
Mark then goes to the bathroom, but on the way gets distracted and wanders into a room with a piano in it. Mark, despite common sense, elects to play this piano, resulting in Nicole flipping out on him and demanding he leave. Nicole's mom overhears this commotion and decides to invite Mark to stay for dinner, despite Nicole's objections. The family then has dinner together, with Nicole's family telling Mark more about her past. It's at this point I think we should note an important detail. A major world event in the world of until then is the ruling. The ruling was an apocalyptic event of hurricanes, earthquakes, and general devastation that occurred around a year prior to the start of the game. It is stated that the ruling is viewed as the world nearly ending. The results of this destruction have been massive casualties and pain. Sophia's aforementioned grandmother, for example, is one such victim of this tragedy. As was Nicole, seeing as her hometown was destroyed by the tragedy, forcing her to move. The next morning, Mark goes to the hospital to visit Sophia's grandmother with Louise. While being at the hospital, Mark's mental strain gets worse, with him swearing the hospital feels similar to something. This strain continues to get worse, and he goes onto an elevator to try to get back to the room with Sophia's grandmother. However, after riding the elevator, he ends up in a strange distorted version of the third floor, where there are several out-of-place things, such as clocks spinning, an empty ward, and an altar. After getting back in the elevator to go to another floor, he exits back onto the floor yet again, this time even further distorted with a red hue, flickering lights, and seeming corruption of random things broken about. Each time he gets on the elevator, it gets worse, with more messages on the walls telling him it's his fault, and more destruction as his mental strain continues to increase. After several tries of trying to get off floor 3, he once again ends up on floor 3, only to see Sophia's grandmother speaking to him, telling him that it was his fault. He exits this disturbed reality, but clearly has severe mental strain and burden from it, as he seems visually tired, as well as in his very next spot of dialogue, accidentally suggests that it's Sophia's fault that her grandmother is in the hospital. After demonstrating that he's clearly mentally unwell at the moment, he decides to go hang out with his friends, Kath and Rydell. Mark's mental instability continues, as while attending the festivities, his hands shake violently, as well as his vision blurring greatly. Images of this alternate reality from the hospital also present themselves as flashes while he walks about. This mental strain only finally comes to an end when he finds Nicole also at the festivities. Nicole seems to calm him down, finally allowing the two to have fun with the rest of the time at the carnival. However, in the process, he completely abandons Kathy to be by herself, likely forgetting that she was even there. Before we really continue, I do want to do a quick little explanation of what seems to be going on here. While it's not concrete at any point what exactly is happening here, it seems that the reason the visions are continuing into the carnival is due to the stress and mental strain caused by the original visions that happened in the hospital. Essentially, it was so traumatic for Mark that he couldn't get over it even after he left the hospital. There is not a lot of evidence to suggest that the visions actually occurring again at the festivities. After the carnival, he goes home without speaking to Kathy at all, only to find her at his house. She suggests that they should hang out together, and he agrees, but spends most of the time on his phone texting Nicole, once again totally brushing off Kathy. Kathy eventually gets his attention, and the two play a racing game together. Kathy is completely destroying Mark before ultimately deciding to let him win the match at the last moment. He celebrates, not realizing what she had done. Mark goes the next day to apply for the piano club, and while playing his mother's song, Nicole overhears. She reveals that she was the one who wrote the song, and helps him play the rest of it together. She then agrees to teach him how to play, with the pair spending the next few days together on trying to improve his skill so he can make it into the club as well as getting closer to each other as friends. After several days, Louise reaches back out to contact Mark about further findings regarding the deja vu situation. Louise concludes that the situation must have been a mental occurrence, as it's the only logical conclusion. She does have an alternate theory, but she refuses to state it at this time. Mark then goes to hang out with Kathy, with the pair going to buy a prom outfit. Kathy has no luck, as her parents refuse to grant her money for such a purchase, and Mark also finds nothing he really likes. The pair try to salvage the day by going to see some fireworks, but it rains, and Kathy's family comes and finds her, forcing her to go home. After this is Christmas. Mark's parents can't make it home for the holidays, leaving him alone. He sits and remembers his past Christmases with his family, 
by himself, convinced he will be forced to spend yet another holiday without anyone. However, Nicole and her family arrive, inviting him to come to their house for Christmas, which he does. Nicole remarks about missing a childhood friend of hers named Jake, and shares more about her past and what she's gone through. However, Mark's mental strain begins to increase again before he falls into a memory of being a child and his mother calling for him. The game cuts to him at home where he practices piano the last night before the audition the next day. The audition occurs the next day and Mark plays Grieg's Wedding Day, demonstrating his skill from practicing with Nicole, likely securing himself a spot in the club. However, Nicole does an audition, refusing to join the club due to her own hesitancy to play the piano from her memories of Jake. Mark confronts her on this, and she apologizes before inviting him to join her on a trip to see her grandparents, who still live in the affected area of the rolling. He agrees to join her on this trip. However, before they can go anywhere, Mark and Louise talk about the deja vu. They discover that the recent string of disappearances, the mental strain, and the deja vu may all be connected to the rain, and that during the rain, it seems that people who aren't being actively observed may vanish. Louise cautions him that there is a storm approaching, However, Mark still decides to leave with Nicole on the trip. Mark and Nicole have a mostly nice date, biking together, sitting on a bench together, and slowly building their bond and relationship stronger. However, this improvement of their dynamic takes a sharp turn in the opposite direction when Nicole decides to head to Jake's old house. She searches the house and finds no traces of him, before yelling at Mark, who yells back. The two head back without a word, having seemingly broken up for a time. Mark looks inward after this and decides to make it up to her. And grow as a person. He brings a gift to her house before preparing for prom. And Mark meets with Kathy in the pair talk. She gives him a gift and requests that they spend the last dance of the night together so she can tell him something serious. They get photos together before Nicole arrives. Nicole arrives and Mark and Nicole apologize to each other and resolve to move forward together as a pair that would help each other. They dance together and Nicole concludes the night with a kiss on his cheek. But after this romantic escapade, Mark looks around and realizes that Kathy is gone. Panicking due to the rain occurring, he races out to find Kathy. Sprinting through the rain, the disturbances get very strong as he hears his mother's voice calling out for him. Resisting it or not, either way he is ultimately overcome by her calls, and tries to hold on to her for one last time. However, she states that she can't keep doing this, and that he has to learn to move on, before letting go of his hand and returning him to reality. Springing through the rain, he finally makes his way to Kathy, who is at a bus station. He calls out to her, and they try sprinting towards each other, but out of the corner of his eye, he sees an approaching truck barreling towards them. He tries to run, but simply isn't fast enough, and Kathy dies before his eyes. At Kathy's funeral, her parents and Rydal, who both played a role in her demise, try to express guilt, but are rejected by Mark, who also demands his father accept the reality of the situation, and that his mother, who has been missing since the start of the game, is actually dead. Mark then tries to move on with life. Several years pass, and the group slowly drifts apart, with ultimately Mark and Nicole being the only two to stay together as they married. Mark seems prepared to move out of his house, likely to move in with Nicole, when he finds an old box of stuff from his high school era. Going through it, he reminisces about his past and how distant he's grown from all his old friends, before finding the gift that Kathy left him, a tape of Louise's boyfriend's band. Playing through the hardly recorded songs, he finds a recording by Kath. In this recording, she expresses dreams for the future and for all of her friends, her hopes to grow as a person and see all of her friends be successful. She also explains that the entire reason she was running away was because she was being abused at home by her parents, and that she couldn't take it anymore and needed to be able to leave to find happiness. He then plays the old save of the racing game, where he finally realizes that Kathy let him win in their race before smiling, and the credits roll. This ending is the first of three, and grants the achievement understanding, because at its conclusion, Mark has finally grown enough as a human to be able to understand what he did wrong as a youth towards his friends. Kathy needed help with her family situation, but he never even noticed due to how focused he was on other things, and although his lack of focus on his best friend led indirectly to her demise, as she tried to run away from it all. This ending, however, isn't the true end, as after the credits, we see a continue button on the screen. Tapping it has a black butterfly fly in before the game moves on to its next cycle. So with the second cycle, the game brings us all the way back to the very beginning of the game, to the night prior to the book report, and Mark playing the fighting game. Afterwards, he heads to bed, ready to restart the same Friday we played at the very beginning of Everton. The second cycle is going to play out in the same way as the first in many ways. However, there are also many differences. 
For the sake of both of our time, I will only go through the differences, and not every single event. First, in this timeline, Ryan and Mark are not groupmates, nor friends, resulting in the group for the book report being him and Kathy instead of him and Ryan. Kathy, unlike Ryan, can't cram as well, resulting in them creating a hard slideshow, which means Louise doesn't have the same amount of respect she did for him as she did in the first time. Mark tries to communicate with her about the deja vu regarding the rain, but this timeline, she lacks it, which creates a further gap between the two. Kathy, eager to repair the gap and try to win the heart of Louise, pushes Mark to go with her to the chess match and give support. But Sophia is gone at this event, and Mark, who in this timeline never even met her, seems to somehow notice her absence. Already confused, he tries to talk to Louise, but due to the memories of the past timeline being partially in his head, he only remembers vague details about things regarding Louise. Mostly things that, again, he would have no way of knowing in this timeline. This occurrence confuses Louise, but she agrees to help and inform him if she finds out any information regarding this disturbance. Afterwards, when he's hanging out with Kath in this timeline, Rito actually does show up. This is because in this timeline, he's had no success with his films, giving him the free time to join for this event. The next bit of the game occurs much the same way. Mark and Nicole meet, they go to her house, and they even seem more friendly this time. With Nicole no longer remarking that she wants to put knives next to her to protect herself from Mark. However, this friendliness is undone when Mark plays her piece on the piano, this time instead of Greek. She flips out of this, storming upstairs, while her family tries to talk to Mark and explain to him that she is sensitive about the piano. The next day, Mark, Rydell, and Kathy hang out and record some lines for Rydell's film. During it, Mark seems to have some vague memories of the past timeline, as he gets extremely emotional over the idea of not seeing Kathy for a long time. After this, him and Rydell later go to a different spot to get some other shots. This spot is a hill cafe, where Mark runs into Louise yet again. Mark explains to her all the memory oddities occurring to him, and she concludes that this must be connected to a series of oddities occurring regarding the double switch experiment, where instead of having the proper response, it has an odd, scientifically impossible result. She resolves to try to figure out what's going on here, and agrees to keep in touch. He then goes to the carnival, which happens without any mental strain or disturbances, allowing him to hang out with Kathy and Rydell without issue. This is also a part of the note to really mention here. Because he never went to the hospital, he never had the flashbacks. And because he never had the flashbacks, he never had the mental strain, which really supports my earlier conclusion that there's nothing special about the carnival. It was just Mark was going through things. Halfway through the night, he departs to hang out with Nicole again. However, while hanging out with her, he partially remembers Kathy's death, causing him to be distraught. Heading home, he finds that Rydell and Kathy are waiting for him, with Kathy staying over to hang out. This time, he instead actually talks to Kathy instead of just brushing her off, and also loses the car game instead of her letting him win, demonstrating just how different their friendship has become in this timeline. Following this, Mark and Nicole once again practice piano together to get into the club. However, Kate informs Mark that Nicole is hiding things from him, which prompts him to ghost Nicole for a little bit. A few days later, Louise has updates prompting Nicole and Mark to go to the lab to talk to her about it. This time, she concludes that the universes must be colliding, and that these collisions are what is causing all of Mark's symptoms, as well as the disappearances and the ruling. After this, Mark goes with Kathy and Rydell to an interview for Rydell's film. The audition doesn't go well, but this time, Kathy and Mark are able to watch the fireworks together without any rain or parental interference. Afterwards, Mark and Kathy talk, with the two coming clean about a lot of things. Mark practically gets Kathy to admit things aren't perfect at home and that she's being abused, but doesn't get all the way there. Christmas occurs, and instead of Nicole, it's Kathy who spends the day with him, with Rydell joining the pair to celebrate with the destroyed cake and pancakes. That night, Nicole, Louise, and Mark all have dreams. Louise dreams of an alternate timeline where she doesn't get accepted for college. Nicole dreams about an audition in the past where she is waiting for Jake to arrive, to which he never does. And Mark dreams about the day his mother vanished. The next day is the audition, where Nicole and Mark both audition separately, the relationship having not healed yet by this point. However, by the end, the two finally talk to each other and try to rebuild their strained relationship with Nicole wanting to go to the refugee center to recover an old scrapbook of Kate's. 
Louise then intercepts them as they head home to talk about her findings. She figures out that areas where people affected by the ruling stay are also the areas that have the most disturbances in the double slit, meaning those are the areas likely most dangerous to travel alone in. The area where Mark and Nicole were going is one of these heavily affected areas, so Louise opts to join them. They find the scrapbook and bond. However, as they get their hands on it, the electrons begin behaving erratically. The resulting disruption causes Louise, Mark, and Nicole to vanish into a dream dimension, which picks up from where their dreams left off. We get confirmation that Jake never showed at the recital, and that Mark's mom vanished that day of the storm, before returning to reality. Before leaving, though, Mark sprints back into the fluctuations to grab the scrapbook, vanishing back into the dream realm, where he sprints in the forest searching for Kathy. He returns to reality, and the three head home, worried about the results of the disruption. Nicole then speaks to Kate and tries to bury the hatchet and move on with their friendship, while Louise talks to her family to try and handle the stress she's been under. Mark, Louise, and Nicole continue to monitor the electrons to make sure they are safe, becoming seemingly close friends to each other. Finally, we are back to the prom. In this timeline, Mark and Nicole are much closer friends to each other and haven't gotten immediately out of a fight. So they take pictures together, and Nicole requests the final dance of the night from him. But before it can happen, Kath is confronted by her parents who demand she goes home. Mark is terrified due to his prior memories that he will lose Kath again, and accidentally freaks her out. Mark tries calling her, but she doesn't answer, and at the same time, the fluctuations begin again. Mark decides to sprint out after Kath yet again to save her, despite the dangers of the fluctuations. Mark is brought to the dream reality again, where he sees memories of his mother leaving him yet again. He tries to hold her hand, but again, his mother leaves him, saying that he can't keep doing this. The fluctuations reach a fever pitch, as Mark nearly reaches Kath. Louise and Nicole sprint after him to try and save him from the fluctuations, but Mark is again too late, and she vanishes before his eyes due to those fluctuations. At the same time, an earthquake opens up, which kills Louise in front of Nicole. With both of them gone, Mark is left devastated, resigning himself to doing anything he can at the hilltop to get the fluctuations to return and try to bring the pair back. In the process, Nicole breaks down from seeing him this way, and leaves him to his mania. So ending two is certainly the worst of the three. During cycle two, Mark became amazing friends with both Kath and Louise, growing far closer to them than in prior cycles, and really being a proper friend. This made the pain of losing them both far worse than it was in the first cycle, leaving him unable to move on in any meaningful way. This is partially demonstrated by even Nicole being unable to shake him out of the state, for even if they married each other in the last timeline, the pain and grief of this timeline is just too much for him to get over, and instead he has become consumed by his grief. The pain and grief is interrupted ultimately by the arrival of the Black Butterfly yet again, which brings us back to the beginning of yet another cycle. With that heartthrob having occurred, we enter the third arc of the game, once again cast back to the Friday of the start of the game. This cycle, there is a key difference, that being the degree of damage being done by the ruling, which has increased substantially. Despite this change, Mark is mostly focused on finding Louise, demonstrating that at least some of the memories from the prior cycle have leaked over. This cycle he remembers not completing the slides ahead of time, but actually has. He talks about the extent of the memory issues being far greater this time to Louise, and gives details of other timelines, but he is unable to remember everything and is unable to figure out what's going on. That night, he reaches out to Nicole on social media, based on vague memories he has of her, only to find out that she also has these vague memories. They message each other, and yet again, the timeline resets. The damage of the ruling is yet again increased, and we are back to Friday yet again. Mark tells Nicole to meet up with him, and with the day reset again, the slide is no longer made. However, this time, he is no longer on a team with Louise, rather, Ryan and Kathy. He finds out that in this timeline, Louise has actually vanished and is gone. He goes through her research to try to figure out what's going on, setting up the experiment again, and when Nicole arrives, he gets all of his memories back from the prior timeline, and it's also suggested that Nicole also got all of her memories back. Preparing Mark for the final leg of the game with all the experiences of the first two acts. The two talk for a bit before going for a handshake, which resets the timeline yet again. New timeline, more damage. This time, the corruption of the president increased the pain caused by the ruling greatly, and the train station, which has been a major method of travel, is now broken. Sophia then texts Mark to inform him that Louise is missing for the report, prompting Mark to go look for her at the hilltop. He finds Louise, who is consumed by her research. 
However, she has no memories of prior timelines, prompting her to not trust Mark and refuse to help him, believing he is only going to steal her research. He convinces her that she's not, but she is still hostile to him. She agrees to share her theory that Nicole and him are interlinked, and that the only way to prevent the timelines from continuing to reset is that they must avoid each other. I might get back to this theory later, because there's some murky water regarding this. But Mark and Nicole, with their full memories of lifetimes together, painfully try to separate each other, going their own way. Despite this, the timeline resets yet again. With the increased damage of the timeline resets, we now see Kath in the hospital, and Kate also in the hospital due to injuries from the ruling. This causes Mark and Nicole, despite wanting to be separated from each other, being destined to meet each other at the hospital. At the hospital, Mark slowly begins unraveling, trying to apologize to Kath, while Nicole struggles with the changes in the timeline that are occurring, resetting her friendship with Kate again. By fate, they meet again in the hospital elevator, causing both Mark and Nicole to undergo the distorted reality in the hospital from the first timeline. This distorted reality shows them both things from their past, and memories causing them both to undergo mental strain. Mark then seems to get memories from tons of realities where he failed to save Kath before the timeline resets again. It's here I want to make a note about why I don't exactly think Louise's theory is correct, and there's a lot of reasons for this. One, in earlier timelines, this was never the case, and there was actually really no evidence for this. Two, and this is really the crucial one here, the timeline reset that Louise makes this theory has them reset despite not interacting with each other. The most crucial piece of evidence against this idea is presented to us in the very timeline that it's presented. And I don't think it's a very logical theory. I think there's a lot of other things that could possibly explain what's causing the resets, and I do think that them interacting directly causes an inset reset, but saying that going away from each other would prevent one just doesn't seem correct. But waking up, Mark finds himself to have collided with Kath, and fresh out of the mental strain, he resolves that he must fix the issues caused by the time sign restarts. Rushing to the lab, he finds Louise is gone again, and that her their actions in the last timeline ended the disruptions that were occurring at the hospital. He then resolves that if they can close all of the disruptions via meeting each other, then they may be able to fix the damage caused by the ruling. They head to a new development built for victims of the ruling and meet up here, this time having a harder time making eye contact with each other. But when they finally lock eyes, reality distorts yet again, having more memories of each other's past presented in this distorted reality. After this, Mark wakes up on the reset day yet again. With the effects of the ruling even worse than it was prior, schooling has stopped due to the extent of the damage and society having degraded. He then heads back to the refugee center to meet back up with Nicole and close another one of these reality disturbances. While locking eyes for this one, the mental strain causes Nicole to collapse. While she is okay, it demonstrates just how difficult closing these pockets has become. After another memory pocket, yet another timeline occurs, with Mark's mental state clearly getting worse and worse as he views more and more of this as his fault, particularly as the extent of the damage has grown even further from its original amount. Mark and Nicole try to head to her old town to try and close the disruption that's occurring there. However, while going there, they see Kate, who interrupts the closing of reality halfway through the process, confronting Nicole, resulting in the timeline resetting in the middle of them trying to reset it. Awakening, Mark finds reality has been brought even further to its knees, his old school having been converted to a relief center due to the extent of the damage that had occurred. He goes upstairs to the school to learn that in this timeline, Louise survived again. She tells him that in this timeline, the pair are good friends, and that she believes it's possible to move on from the damage that has occurred. It is possible that in this scene, Louise has slightly lost her mind, due to the extent of damage and her degrading mental state from time to timeline. She gives him a pass to get out of the school, but as he goes to close the final mental strain point, he is unsuccessful, as Kath meets him there, and she vanishes before his eyes yet again. Several timelines seem to pass at this point, with society being more and more destroyed in each timeline, as he refuses to give up, convinced that he can fix it all. The effects of this do more and more damage to his psyche, to he's driven to near madness, to a similar level of madness society has been driven to due to the destruction. As he conveys to Kath in this apocalyptic timeline that he must save her, she tries to reassure him before vanishing before his eyes, followed shortly by reality itself vanishing. We are now on the final stretch. As Mark and Nicole are both put into the void, likely the final result of the destruction in space-time caused by the ruling and the timeline resets, 
I think it's apt here that I try to explain something that earlier in the video I've kind of not given much of detail to, that being the memories of the past experienced during the closing of reality seats. The reason being, the prime information is given at this point in the game, and detailing it here I feel is less confusing. Trying to put together the scattered little bits of detail we get while the realities are closing would just be a lot more confusing, and I feel like it's better to present it all here. Let's start with Nicole. When Nicole was younger, she used to play piano with a close friend of hers. This is Jake. Jake and her were close friends, with him even playing a role in the creation of her signature song. Jake, however, at home was facing family issues, with his mother deciding to run away from home with him. While we don't know what happened when the two ran away, we do know that this eventually resulted in Jake's death somehow. There are very slight suggestions that it might be Jake's father's fault. Nicole was never made aware of Jake and his mom's plans, as Jake never told her. So when she performed for her audition, which is where Mark's mom would learn the piece, and he wasn't there, she was distraught. After the performance, she was focused on finding him again. However, Kate, Jake's sister, wanted her to move on and stop searching, saying that you weren't even close enough friends if he didn't tell you anything. This led Nicole to be haunted by guilt. Guilt that she couldn't find him, and guilt that he didn't tell her anything. This guilt manifested across the timelines, with her inability to move on pushing her to give up the piano, since it was something that they did together. Her guilt also played a crucial role in the falling apart of her friendship with Kate, as she wasn't able to move on pushing the two apart. Mark's guilt is connected to his mother. When he was younger, his mother was pushed to work abroad, to give him the opportunity to have a good life. Despite the fact that she did this for him, he refused to thank her, refused to accept her presence, and held a dislike towards her for what he viewed as abandoning him. So when she went missing due to the flight's disappearance, he was overcome with guilt and grief. At first, and in earlier timelines, this grief manifested as flat-out denial that she was gone, instead believing that she would just return. However, over the course of the game, he came to accept that she was gone, but so held guilt that he didn't appreciate her enough while she was around, or for all the things she did for him. However, neither Jake nor Mark's mom wanted them to feel guilt for what they did. Instead, they both wanted them to accept their past and move on with their lives. To achieve this from beyond the grave, it is suggested that they influenced the flow of realities and time itself to cause the ruling, an event which caused the two of them to ultimately meet, allowing them to heal from each other. Essentially, the theory Louise positive of universes combining and colliding with each other being something purposefully done by Mar Jake and Mark's mom. Eventually, however, they lost control of the distortion of time, resulting in the loops we see later in game, or really after the second loop, where reality begins rapidly decaying. Why they lost control isn't known by either Jake or Mark's mom, but it can be suggested that it may partially be due to the extreme levels of emotion that Mark was feeling at the end of the second timeline. So while in the void, Mark and Nicole begin to be shown memories from each other's past, slowly gaining a complete story on what makes the other tick and the root of their respective guilt. After gaining a full understanding of each other, they both emerge in a field of white bare trees, seemingly a location that is outside the traditional realities and time itself. In this location, there is a white piano, which both Nicole and Mark approach. They cannot see each other or hear each other, but upon playing the piano, they can hear each other playing, thinking that it's either Jake or Mark's mother. But as they play, they slowly figure out that it's actually each other, using the piano as a way of communicating about each other's presence. But with the distorted state of reality, they are really unable to interact with each other, bar things that interact with the space itself. They try to communicate via the ripples of rocks, but they are paralyzed by their guilt and fear that anything they may do may just make it worse than it already is. Stopped by their guilt yet again, finally, at this point, do the butterflies directly intervene, speaking to them and telling them that it's okay and they don't need to worry. However, as they continue expressing guilt and talking to the butterfly, they're realizing they're actually talking to their opposite's missing person, i.e. Mark was talking to Jake and Nicole to Mark's mother. They talk for a bit with each opposite, helping them to finally get over the grief they felt, and helping them finally accept and move on with their life. They talk to each other at this point, expressing how much they appreciate each other and how it's okay for each each other to move on from their grief. With the grieving expressed, they finally accept themselves, and they can now move on with their lives. But they seem to understand that doing so is going to reset the timeline yet again, this time without the influences of the lost individuals or the butterflies, most likely meaning an end of their interconnectivity. They say a final goodbye to each other one last time, and reality resets yet again, 
bringing us to the end of the game and the epilogue. With the job I expressed, the timeline resets, this time with the rolling no longer occurring, and Mark and Nicole having both moved on from their respective pains, allowing them to live happy lives without the pain of the past. Without the pain of his mother, Mark in this new timeline is able to go and help Rydell find Kathy in the woods after she runs away. The two hug, and Mark reaffirms that him and Rydell will always be there for her. This timeline, as a result, is greatly different from the original one. Kathy becomes on good terms with her brother, who seems to give her the help she needs to deal with the pain caused by her parents. Due to the lack of the ruling, Sophia's grandmother never gets into an accident, and Nicole's hometown is never destroyed. Nicole becomes great friends with Kate, and Nicole returns to playing the piano, finding happiness without the devastation of her home. Louise gets into the dream college, but Mark and Nicole never meet. As without the ruling, there is no reason for her to move to his town and for the two of them to cross paths. Mark and Kathy grow up and move in together, seemingly being happy in their respective careers and lifestyle. But the final mark of the game sees our main couple seemingly moving towards a faded date, going to the same cafe to try both going on a date. But the final mark doesn't give us the happy ending we want. Rather, instead, their date is with different people. So with the entirety of the plot done, let's get into breaking down this ending. The first major point of confusion seems to be exactly what just happened. Well, after the timelines fell apart, Mark and Nicole moved on from their grief. This moving on allowed Mark to grow as a person from a much earlier point. The scene we see of him sprinting in the forest is alluded to have happened prior to the first playthrough in the intro cutscene. The exact occurrence of this cutscene and what exactly is happening here is currently very hard to understand. This is a memory from the past of a moment where Kath tried to run away before only ending up wrangled back home? Is this the original timeline and the moment that original Kath passed away, akin to her death at the bus station? Or is this timeline completely unique from the others, breaking away from everything we know prior? It's currently hard to make a conclusive statement as to the nature of this event, and it'll likely require future theorizing. But what we do know is that the result of this event is that Mark is able to pay attention to Kathy, a result which prevents him from not noticing her abuse and ultimately allowing him and her brother to step in earlier and a result which we see across the epilogue. Without this abuse, she has no reason to run away anymore, ending the cycles of her death and allowing her to have a happy ending she wanted from the beginning. A happy ending we get to see play across the epilogue. The second major note is why did this timeline end up being such a good one, despite everything else that's been occurring? Well, as we learned prior, the root of the ruling was actually from Jake and Mark's mom's interference. Seeing as the ruling was such a devastating event for most of our characters, if the ruling does not occur, then it carries that most players would have a happier life. Seeing as the timeline editing was done in an effort to help the respective individuals get past their grief, now that they are indeed past their grief, it only follows that there is no need for the ruling to occur anymore. Without the ruling, a lot changes, as we can see from the slideshow of all the characters' lifespans, but chiefly, there is no reason for Mark and Nicole to ever meet their combined destiny that has dominated all prior timelines. This partially explains the final issue. Why didn't they end up together? For without the strands of fate being forcefully tied together by the butterflies, there is nothing pushing them to be together. And for those of you that dislike their couple, this is the explanation that's best for you, demonstrating that both individuals can now move on fully with their lives from the hell that was caused by the ruling, to live out their own destiny. However, for those of you who are like me, was a huge fan of Mark Hole, there's an alternative theory that disagrees that this is the end result. This interpretation of the ending hinges on the name of the cafe, which translates to destiny. The two of them being in the same cafe called Destiny seems to suggest that these dates they are on are is only temporary and that in the end, they will find each other, as they are ultimately bound by destiny. Either way, the game was a work of art. Its demonstration of characters and tragic plot clearly shows the devs have some serious writing skills, and I eagerly await future content from them. Now that the video is concluded, I want to take a quick moment to thank my channel members, Wheat and Derek Tsai, whose financial support helps me create videos like this. If you are a huge fan of the game who's found yourself addicted to it, feel free to check out the two discords linked below or Reddit to find more people to talk about the game with. But for now, that's all I've got for you. I hope you all enjoyed this video, and well, I'll see you next time. Until then, ciao.